Look at I have fans. And I do know that I have one fan watching live streaming in Smithville, Tennessee. So uh, say hi to Donna in Smithville, Tennessee. Donna and I became friends at the ASNE Institute at Kent State in 2008. So guaranteed you will stay in touch with some of these people. Some people you'll go, I hope I never see them again, right? <laughs> right. You know it. You know who you are. Okay. All right, so today, for the next hour and a half, we're going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of what to teach your kids. Um, how, how do you teach them to write journalistically? Well, before they ever write, they have to find the story. There's a lot that goes on before they ever sit down at the computer and write. So there's storytelling skills. And, and I say on here, it's an intimate look at news gathering. And I say intimate because interviewing, finding the story is an intimate thing. Why? Because we're interviewing people. We don't go out and interview the trees or dogs. We interview the owners of dogs and the property owners of trees that have fallen on their cars. So it's intimate. And to get our students to understand that, because what do they want to do? They just want to wait till the last minute. You assign them a story. They wait till the last minute the night before their first draft is due, they make a quick phone call, no one answers, they don't leave a message because oh, I'm not going to do that, I'll call back later. And then the next day the draft is due and they have a great excuse. Hey, I tried, they didn't answer. So when did you try? Last night, okay? And so it's intimate. In order to get to know a friend, in order to get to know your spouse, um, you have to spend time with that person. And part of it is, I don't know, how many of you are married in here? Okay, I've been married 25 years. When I met my husband, I, was, uh, I went to Northern Arizona University. I worked on the news newspaper. I was a journalism major. My husband was a forestry major. So, of course, I went in on story idea day and said, hey, what about the forestry program? Have we written a story about that? No. Well, I know for a fact that they're going out into the field to measure trees and all this kind of stuff, do land development. I'd love to cover that story. So I went out for a full day. I had my eye on this guy. And of course, all my pictures and my interviews were of my future husband. And it was a great story, but my editor did say, how come you only focused on one person? <laughs> because it was intimate, and it became much more intimate. I've been married 25 years to that same forestry major. So, um, oh, what happened? Okay, what happened is I'm using a school computer. Notice it's a Dell. I have a MacBook Pro at home, just want to let you know, because when you own a Mac, you're proud of it. I'm not a PC person. If you are, I'm sorry. But my 16-year-old daughter, you know, you just can't get on Facebook on this. So anyway, I had to leave that with her. All right, so it's intimate. Storytelling skills, we need, to, we need to be, we need to know, and we need to do. I love verbs. And if you're an English teacher like myself, words are important. And so storytelling skills is an action, OK? So you need to be. Um, and I put, hey, good looking, OK? I tell my kids, hey, you should want to interview. I mean, one of the first questions you should ask is, um, are you dating anyone? Can I have your phone number for follow-up questions, OK? Um, all right, how to be a journalism student. There is a wiki um, that was started by this lady up there. You can go to it. This presentation is in your resources. I believe it's on your name tags, so don't worry about it. And it's on your handout. Um, but I added a few things of my own to this wiki, but how to be a journalism student. They need to read the news. I mean, how many of your students don't have a clue what's going on? So get in the habit of asking your students, all right, what's going on? What's going on in our community today? What's happening in our state, our nation, our world? And then they'll, it's not current events like you do in history. Don't make it boring. Um, I give my kids 10 bonus points for um, signing up on Twitter. In North Dakota, Twitter just isn't going over. Um, hopefully one day it will, but my students for 10 bonus points will sign up. They need to follow five uh, news organizations or people, one of them including myself. 
And, and so they do for the 10 bonus points. So then what I do is I come in and I say, what, what's happening on Twitter? What did you learn on Twitter that's happening in our world today? And they love the bonus points, so it gets them going there. Um, forget you have an opinion. How many of your students join journalism because they have a lot to say? How many of them love the opinion unit? Oh yeah, at the end of my Journalism 1 class, they do a portfolio and they have to present that portfolio and 90% of them say, well, my favorite part was writing my personal column, okay? But really, overall, they need to forget that they have an opinion to be a journalist. Um, listen to everyone about everything. You'll hear from your students that there's nothing happening at our school, there's nothing going on, no one has a story, we're all boring, I, I wish we lived in Columbia, Missouri, because then we'd have something to do. But they need to learn to listen. Kids are so busy talking about themselves, actually humans in general, that we don't take the time to listen, okay? All right, make contacts. I tell my kids, um, really, to be successful in life, they need two things. They need knowledge, they need an education, and that is so important. But they also need to network. If they're not out there talking to people, getting to know people, it doesn't matter how educated you are. But it also doesn't matter how many people you know if you're not educated, okay? And so that's a life skill, but in journalism, they need to start meeting people because one person will lead to another person, to another contact, to another story. All right, get a life. A journalist needs to be an observer of life. That means they have to do a lot more than sit in class all day, go home and sit in front of the computer. They need to get a life. They need to get out. Um, don't sit around waiting for an email reply, and a lot of my students don't use email. They don't even have an account. But they'll, they'll text someone, they'll text a source, or they'll Facebook message them, and then they just sit around and wait for four days, and, and that person never gets back to them. So you got to teach them. you got to keep reminding them, don't wait. you got to be a little pushy to be a journalism student. Learn how to spell. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. Be open to new experiences. You know, when I talked about my kids going up to Williston, North Dakota, that in the whole year, those two days were the best two days we spent. Um, that open them up to, wow, if I pursue a story, look how exciting it can be. Instead of, I have to do this story. Read books. You know, we need to encourage our kids to read. And there's so many great books out there. Um, get them to read other journalists. Rick Bragg, um, Rick Riley, right? Sports guy, hilarious. Um, Boy, get them to read everything. Who's the lady who wrote The Glass Castle? Uh, Jeanette Walls, okay? She ended up at Columbia getting her journalism degree. Grew up in poverty in the South. Um, get them to read. Have those books available in your room. Um, I've never assigned them, but I have them. My students ask me, and I freely lend them out. So get your kids to read books. And know what the rules are so you can break them. I always tell my kids, especially when we get into writing in the next session, there are some journalistic formulas of writing that, that are good. It's a good way to start. And I tell my kids, when you can follow the rules, then I'll let you break them. Because you want them to break them. You want them to find their own voice, and you want them to make it theirs. But they can't do that successfully until they actually know what the rules are. All right, know what you want to get out of this and chase it. I think when our students are assigned stories, and we'll get into that more, they don't even know what it is they're going after. I have kids all the time come up to me the next day after stories have been assigned, and they come to me and I redirect them to the editor, but they go, what is this? What am I supposed to do? I said, well, I don't know. Did you, what did they say? I don't know. <laughs> So you have a name, yeah, I have a name, but what about them? I don't know, okay, so they have to really know what they're chasing. How are they going to catch it if they don't know? Learn shorthand, and not really the shorthand like you can take a class and learn it, but their own version. It doesn't matter, but 
in an interview, they need to be able to take notes and take them fast. We'll get into interviewing in a little bit too. Be curious. I worked for a, uh, a weekly paper in Casper, Wyoming for about three and a half years. I wrote feature stories. I loved it. My husband laughed because I would go for an interview and whatever I was interviewing that person about, it was their passion. That's the fun thing about feature stories is the person is passionate about what you're interviewing them about. And so then I would become passionate and I would come home and tell my husband and go, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and you know, boy, you got to get kids to experience that because then you're curious, then you want to know more, then you ask good follow-up questions. Um, engage in conversation. I think kids have, who has their volume? <laughs> I'm getting feedback. Um, engage in conversation. They need to be social and not just on Facebook. Um, it was funny, yesterday we took a bathroom break. I don't know who was with me, but we walked around the corner and there's a group of women and we're like, oh, the line's too long. Oh, no, it's not. We're not in line. We're talking. Well, that's so unusual that people are talking, okay? But they need to learn how to be social. So Facebook, Twitter, that is a way to be social as well. There's a social media experiment I was telling Aaron Manful about yesterday. Ironically, it was on his site, <laughs> but I told him about it. And it's, if you want it, email me and I'll send it to you. But it's a two-week experiment where your kids can choose any social media that they want. Could be Tumblr, could be Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. I had one kid that said, I'm not on any of that. I'm not going to do it. And I said, well, you, knew, you need to do it. So he chose texting. I said, that's OK. Basically, they had, to, they had to write down how many followers they have in the beginning, um, what they usually talk about, all this kind of stuff, and then what their purpose for the two weeks is going to be. They needed to promote something or push out some information. They had to use it professionally. So whether it was an upcoming conference or a concert, or they wanted people to start recycling, they're sick of seeing bottles all over the school floor. Um, whatever it was, they had to use social media to do that. And then at the end of two weeks, they had to track their progress and then do an evaluation. Did you receive any negative comments? How did you handle it? How many positive comments did you get? Did you get any new followers? Great, great, great. The kids, several of them said, I had no idea that this is what social media can be used for because they've never done it. So it's a way for them to be social, doing what they're already doing, but see a purpose in it, okay? Um, see stories from all angles. I love asking my brand new journalism students, how many sides of a story are there? Two. Haven't we grown up that there's always two sides to a story? No, there's all sides to a story. And you have to, and, and then I say, where do you get your news? You know, is it, is it CNN, is it Fox, is it radio, is it newspaper, is it Twitter? And then I encourage them not to get their news from only one source. They, they need to really get it from several sources and then figure it out what they believe is true, okay? Uh, read, write, read, write. Sounds like our read-write program. But they need to be doing both. If they want to be a great writer, they need to read great writing but they also need to write. It's just like weightlifting. It's just like running. In my mind, I'm a runner. In real life, I'm not. And I do run, I run one mile a day. So if any of you ever want to be a runner, that's all I run. One mile it takes me almost 11 minutes. But I'm not a runner, my husband's a marathon runner. But, oh well, I run my one mile a day. But if I didn't do that, I guess I should progress. Because if you're writing, you should be writing better. But you have to do both. You have to write, you have to read. You have to write, you have to read. You don't just write, okay? Be willing to fail. And I loved what Arnie said yesterday about if you're not failing, you're not taking enough chances. And we need to create an environment in our classrooms where our students know it's okay to fail, okay? And they need to ask why. Why do two-year-olds lose that ability to ask why? I love there's some commercial on where the kid's like, why, 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 why? And the guy's trying to wash his car. Have you seen that? Why, why? And he's like, I don't know, go ask your dad. Why? <laughs> okay, but they need, to, they need to bring that back. 
And don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. And really, this is up to you. If, you if, if, if they say something and you say it's stupid, or your body language says it's stupid, they're going to stop asking stupid questions. And so you need to create that safe environment. All right. So the story is, so now, if you can kind of groom them, create an environment for them to be a journalism student, then they need to know what the story is. What is the story that they're covering? There's, in general, three different types of stories. There's breaking news. So give me an example of breaking news. Supreme Court upholds Obamacare. OK, Supreme Court upholds Obamacare. OK, that's breaking news. It's national news that applies to them um, at their school, everyone in our country. Um, what else? A lockdown, breaking news. What else? A natural disaster. In North Dakota last summer, we flooded. Like 30-some percent of our town was underwater. It was just awful. This year, dry as can be, right? End of the world, 2012. But that is breaking news. So when you have a monthly news magazine, how are you breaking news? Twitter. Facebook, website, okay? But it doesn't mean you don't do it. It doesn't mean you don't cover breaking news. You just can't cover it in your monthly news magazine. Breaking news is what's happening now. Did a teacher in your school just recently get fired? Um, did someone resign spur of the moment? Did a program get canceled? <laughs> she has yes to every, answer, every question. Holy smoke, someone interview her. <laughs> this is breaking news. Um, that, you need to get up on the website. Sports scores, games, that's breaking news, OK? Every time there's a game, that's breaking news. But you need to get it, if you don't have a website, you need to get it out on Twitter. And part of that is getting your followers to follow you if they want that information. OK, then we have informational stories. This is what your students are hearing around school. And that's where we go back to how can they be a journalism student? They need to listen to everyone and everything. And I tell them the lunchroom is awesome. I don't hear the students talk as much as they do because students say a whole lot more when teachers aren't around. Okay? I think it was not last year, a year before, we had 12 pregnant girls in our school. It was a cold winter. Cold, cold prom that year. <laughs> so we had 12 pregnant girls. That was a story. I didn't know who they all were, but they found out. All you had to do was listen. Okay? Um, but that's what everyone is talking about. Those are stories that are about information that is important to your student body. And more than likely, informational stories are timely. Like, we need to cover this in our next issue. We need to promote it on our website, Twitter, Facebook. We need to cover it. And then let's talk about how we can extend it. Okay? Then we have evergreen stories. Anyone know what these are? They are always there. They are good anytime. And so you kind of, it comes to January, and you kind of agree with your kids, like, yeah, nothing's going on. <laughs> and you pull out some evergreen stories. Um, some good ones would be, um, health and fitness. Um, it's a good time to do a story about a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> have you ever done those? <laughs> um, it's a good time to look at um, maybe a program that's long standing in your school, such as ReadWrite. How many of you have ReadWrite? One person? Great program. ReadWrite is a program that teaches reading comprehension. And it, I know it's in our middle schools and our high schools. Fantastic program. There is a stigma applied to the students from the other students who take Read Write, but we're breaking that because we wrote a story about it. Read Write was started in the business world. Um, the Ford Motor Company uses it. Um, and basically, any one of you could sit down and be evaluated in Read Write, and they would tell you what your reading comprehension level is, and I think we would all be shocked. Um, not, not your Lexile score. You can probably read way past college material. But what's your comprehension? And what they watch for is um, hesitations, where you stumble. Because when you do that, and they have you read out loud, you aren't comprehending. You go into a different mode. And my own daughter took it. Her, 
she graduated a couple years ago, but she, as a junior, they said, you should probably take it because of your reading scores. And she graduated with a 3.9, but her reading scores were low. And so she was mad. Oh my goodness, was she mad. She was a volleyball player and she was on my newspaper staff and she took it. And w after two weeks, it was her favorite class. And she proudly told people she was in Read Write. She loved Read Write. She loved her Read Write teacher. Um, I said, anyone who graduates from Read Write, tell me when you graduate, because after they graduate, it becomes a study hall for them. As soon as you graduate, I will gangsta dance on the table in my room. So that's become the celebration. So they want to graduate Read Write, so I will gangsta dance. And don't ask me to do it. No, it's not good. I used to do the worm across my table until my chiropractor told me not to do that anymore. <laughs> so, but we'll, and we'll get into that when we talk about motivating students later today. Um, but evergreen stories. So read, write, we did that. We needed a filler and it was awesome. One of my students was upset with the price of water bottles in the kitchen. So you could go in the kitchen, get donuts, whatever, pizza. Then there's like a cooler with juice and water. And, Outside the kitchen, we had vending machines. So inside, they sold Aquafina water, um, I forget how many ounces, let's say 16 ounces for $1.50. Outside in the vending machine, you could get a 20 ounce Aquafina bottle for $1.25. So her question was, why are the water bottles in the lunchroom more expensive and smaller than the ones in the vending machine? Well, she did some investigative reporting and found out that, well, well, first she heard all sorts of stories and she went all the way to the district. Um, first it was, well, part of our money, is money that we bring in is to fund kids who have reduced lunches, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, little story came out. It was real little. Um, she interviewed people. There was some discrepancy. They did not have a good reason for doing it. And guess what? Today at Century High School in Bismarck, North Dakota, the water bottles are the same price. And she is so proud of that story. Um, and so that's an evergreen story. It's kind of breaking news. But once it was discovered, we could really plan when we wanted to do it. And so even if it's important, you have to ask yourself, is this really breaking news? We didn't have to put the water bottles on Twitter or on the website. We could have. But we could. she worked on it. She did some investigation and then wrote it. All right. So once you have a story idea, that's not an angle. So what is your assignment is to write a local story. Am I correct? OK. So Columbia, Missouri is not an angle. Columbia, Missouri is a topic. And on Story Idea Day, your kids will come to class with a lot of topics. OK. But what is the angle? So what about Columbia, Missouri? I was hearing some great ideas last night. Is this secret? Or can you share what your local ideas are? It's not secret. I, I, would you mind sharing? Oh, yeah, there's a Easter Girls concert just up the street. So okay. We were talking about that and how we're interested in their music. And I'm 42. Okay. I've been a fan of them ever since I was in college. Awesome. And I'm curious to see them still playing That's at great. college you know, 20 years later. So we started talking about things like what makes certain types of music Mm -hmm. universally appealing to 20-year-olds and 20-year-olds. We talked about other artists that we know and like. Absolutely. Who have changed over the years, maybe have they reinvented themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but yep. they, they really haven't. Their music is the same, and yet people of all ages still love them. Mm -hmm. What's the draw there? So they're going to go stand outside the concert, Good. interview some people, and see what okay. some of their Great, great. And what I'll probably do, because these are a little bit longer answers, but we're going to do a microphone. How do I turn on it? Oh, no, I got it. Okay, great. So that was a local concert. Um, so what is Columbia, Missouri is the topic, but the angle is this concert. And how are they coming back? And they've been around for a while. And how will the people of Columbia um, receive them? Okay. All right, what's another idea? Who wants to share? Okay. We went to eat pizza at Shakespeare's. All right. And um, I don't really, I don't, I'm not really sure why they call it Shakespeare's. It has this <laughs> kind of this really quirky decor. 
But one of the oddities that they have is that on the menu, under exotic um, toppings, they have WD-40. <laughs> so All right. we went to the counter, and um, they actually have a can of WD-40 in the beer cooler. Awesome. And so I asked Caleb, the guy who was working the cash register, what was the deal about WD-40 in the fridge? And he goes, it stays colder there. <laughs> and then I said, OK, let me rephrase that question. Why the WD-40? Right. And he goes, I have no idea. He goes, it goes way back in the annals of Shakespearean history. Awesome. And then I got some very suggestive comments from the pizza guy who was talking <laughs> about why WD-40 in Shakespeare. And so um, it's just kind of a thing that we're yeah. now trying to figure out exactly All what right. the deal is with the WD-40. Very good, very good. All right, let's hear one more. Here's another group. What are you guys doing? OK, there we go. Uh, Ana Romero. Ana Romero, who's a professor here, is actually holding a journalism workshop for high school students down in the basement of this, well, of the Walter Williams, the Neff building. Um, and so we wanted to go check them out because it's apparently pretty competitive. They had a bunch of people, a bunch of high schoolers apply, and they only chose 20 because okay. they're on full scholarship, kind of like us. Awesome. Uh, and so we're, we're going to go check into that. OK, uh, excellent. OK, notice those are angles. For one thing, what I hear you saying is, again, you're not just saying, I'd like to cover the pizza, re the restaurant called Shakespeare's. That's still a topic. It's the pizza place in Columbia, Missouri, but the angle is the quirkiness, this WD-40, talking about why, why, why the history and the mystery, okay? So that's great. You already have some information. That's what we have to get our students to do. So you have to get them to come to Story Idea Day with angles not topics. One way to do that is to have them come with the story idea, the angle, have them write it out in one sentence, their angle, and four, list four people that they plan to talk to. Okay, Because if they have to think through it that much, they're going to have to do some research. They're going to have to talk to some people before story idea day. But boy, when I was a brand new advisor, story idea day was a mess. I'd like to write on abortion. Do you know anyone? No. I'd like to write on suicide, students committing suicide. Do you know anyone? No. OK? And so they want to do these hot topics, which that's great. But boy, they got to have people. They got to they know who they're talking to, and they have to start early. All right. So refining your story idea. This worksheet is actually on your flash drive. And for those of you in live streaming land, it's it's out there on the website, I believe. Um, so you need to train your kids, get them to think twice about the story they're writing. And these are good questions before they even interview the person. So when they come and they have their idea and their angle, will the story have something to say? No. OK. My favorite question to ask them is, are you interested? No. OK. Um, will it be interesting? Can the idea behind the story be stated simply in one sentence? If they can't put their angle in a sentence, then they don't have an angle. So that's great practice. Um, is it timely? It could be an evergreen story. That's fine. It could be, yeah, we need to do it right now. Um, but they need to ask themselves that question. Does it contain a slant or an angle um, that will limit the scope? So not Columbia, Missouri. What about Columbia, Missouri? Um, do they know how long the story might be? That's another practice in another session. I don't know if you're going to do something like this here, but maestro. Maestro meetings? I don't know. It's, it's a pretty cool concept. I really can't go out. I mean, Google it. M-A-E-S-T-R-O, maestro meetings, where you have your designer, your photographer, your editor, and the writer all in about a three-minute meeting. That, that oh, my goodness. Newspapers. They work OK. The, uh, I've spent 25 years in newspapers. That, that, is a brilliant method to bring everyone. And this would work in the yes, classroom setting. Yes, absolutely. Bring our class together, mm -hmm. you talk about the story, you plan out questions, you, yep. you know how you want to present yep. the story, photo, graphics, exactly. art. Yep. Everybody's in on it at the beginning. Everyone's in on it. When you open a newspaper and you have a spread and it's a story, you can tell if the photographer, writer, and designer worked independently because it looks very independent. You can tell when they got together. 
and they planned it out. And the photographer went with the writer to the second interview, and they knew they needed a horizontal shot with the person in the right-hand side with the landscape behind or whatever because they planned it out. You can tell. Maestro, I love the name. It's, they orchestrate it so that it works well together. Um, but in general, when you have a story angle, you can tell about how long of a story it will be. And the designer needs to know that ahead of time, not during layout, okay? Oh, hang on. Uh, let's see what else is here. Um, does the idea center on a person or a group of people? Again, journalism is intimate. It's about people. So even when my kids write about issues, I'm like, who's the face for the issue? Got it. Every story is a feature story. I know we have a feature section and a sports section and a news and opinion, entertainment, but every single one of those stories is a feature story. So you gotta drill that in to them that it's about people. Um, is the idea fresh? It's like my research paper in English. Don't you have topics that you tell your kids you can write on anything but these? Abortion, legalizing marijuana, right? <laughs> no, not going to do it. Um, and is the reporter capable of developing the idea into a story? In the, in the real journalism world, which I tell my kids they're in, I had a parent call me one time. She was upset that we put a poem in our um, paper on the back page that won second place at a national convention. Had two swear words in it. Can I say them? on live stream, shit and damn. There are worse. And it was about a homeless person. It was beautiful. Second place nationally. We had a meeting about it. Well, you can't censor literature. I mean, we're not going to censor anything we're doing. You can't censor that. So we had to decide, are we putting it in or not? This mom called me, furious. Her daughter went there. She had three other daughters coming up through the school. She was very upset with me. I listened to her, and she said, do you realize that you have just given permission to the entire student body to swear? And I said, well, with all due respect, they're already swearing. <laughs> and they're saying things much worse than that. And this is literature. And I, I went over. I was respectful, but I said, we did have a meeting about it. Um, we believed it was important that our student body celebrate with her and that it was good liter literature. So anyway, she said, I'm going to be watching you because I have three more kids coming through the school and I haven't heard from her since. So, so it's okay. Not that we're not doing things, but I think maybe she got it. I don't know. But we are doing real journalism. Um, but when I worked for the paper in Wyoming, there is something to be said for earning the right to write the bigger stories. And so I tell my editors that. For a while, they were just going, OK, who wants to write this one? Who wants to write this one? And we had the poorest writer on staff wanting to write the story about the 12 pregnant girls. Because it's great, and it's, they'll get a lot of kudos for it, but they, they're not a good writer. They need to develop that skill. And so really, they need to ask themselves, and you need to ask yourself, is that the right writer for that story? And if they want to get better, they're going to have to work on some smaller stories. And you got to really work with your editors to not be afraid to not give their friends certain stories. Okay? All right. So, so we have now, we have a journalist who's being. We know what our story is. We know what our angle is. So who do we talk to? Okay? Who does the student talk to? Um, finding sources. How do you find people? First, you need to find a primary source. I've read a lot of stories, both in our daily paper and in our high school paper, where there really isn't a primary source. It's filled with secondary sources. Okay, but they need to, who's the face? Who's the face for the story about some, something that's changing, a program that's changing in the school? That's okay to write about the program change, but who's the face? Who can give an intimate look at that change, okay? And so you need to find a primary source. And then they need to keep the focus on the primary source while telling about the issue, okay? One way I have them do this early on in my J Journalism 1 class is they write a defining moment story. And they pair up in the class, and they have to find out what each other's defining moment is. 
Could be they moved, they lost a best friend, there was a death in the family, there was divorce, accident, something like that. They interview each other, and they are each other's primary source. Then they have to talk to at least two more sources about the primary source. And that's the differentiation there, is the secondary sources are giving you information about the primary source or the issue, if it's about the issue, if it's a feature story about that person, they're talking about that person. And, and kids can really veer off of the primary source. And all of a sudden, they're talking about the coach more than they're talking about the player, OK? Um, but it's great. So they write that story, and, and they're like, oh, we have to call people because it's their first story. And I said, yep, you need to get the phone number and the name of the person that you can contact, blah, blah, blah. And so it's a good way to get your kids to write their first story. The next story I have them write, I say, you can't interview anyone in this room, and you can't interview any family members. <gasps> That's when they really have to go out, OK? And then there's documents. There's everything out on the web um, as far as resources go. I tell my students not to overdo that, overuse that that they, you know, the best thing is to find those primary and secondary sources. So how do you find them? And we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but word of mouth, um, listening in the lunchroom, they're going to find that primary source. They may find a secondary source that's talking about the primary source, but that secondary source, you can get their number, and then you know who your primary source is. Uh, other news stories. That's why we need to encourage them to be reading the daily paper. They need to be on Twitter. Um, you know, I've had some success stories. I was talking about this last night with some people um, where they have stepped out and tried to get a hold of a, a celebrity, a famous person. Um, our AP science classes were going to see the Body Worlds exhibit in Minneapolis. And so my daughter, oldest daughter, was on staff then, and she said, well, I'm going to get a hold of the guy who does the exhibit. He's a German man. He was in Germany. She located his information. She emailed him. He emailed back. So he was part of her story. She got to talk to him directly. We were doing a story about a, a recent school shooting, not in our area, um, but in the United States. And we thought, well, let's, let's talk about safety in schools. And I still can't think of the name of the celebrity. He's big into guns. Maybe it was Ted Nugent. I, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, they, I said, go for it. Why not? Why would you not get someone big? And they contacted him. Um, unfortunately, our deadline came. They wrote the story. The story was published. And then he responded. But the fact is, he did respond. Yes? When it comes to your students interviewing primary sources, mm -hmm. how are you successful with Oh, very good question. How successful am I in letting students out of class during class time to go interview primary sources? We have channel one time. No one watches it, but we have 15 minutes. <laughs> and we've actually been given permission not to watch it. So we have 15 minutes. My newspaper class every year is second period. We have channel one time. So I tell them if they would like to go interview someone or make a contact that they go during that time. Um, Otherwise, my students are free to use their phones during class. I have a back room that used to be a dark room, and then they convert it and just put counters back there. And so they can go back there. They can uh, make some calls. Um, yep, yep, I'll give them teacher emails. They can set up an appointment, and they sit down and email them. The only hiccup there, and administration is really good with me, is my kids generally are everywhere. And then when you get a sub, I have to write in my sub notes. Editor so-and-so is in charge. Students may come and go as they need to to cover their stories. Otherwise, they're like, no, get in here. You can't leave. The only problem is when you have a fire drill. <laughs> and one time, we actually had a real fire in our school. It was January, about five years ago. And some kids put matches inside a locker and set a coat on fire. And smoke, it was awful. Well, I use newspaper time because the kids are so independent. Um, and sometimes I'll help them out. Like I can go get a, st uh, um, a student's home number or their schedule for them. And so sometimes I'll leave class. I just, they're working. So I'll walk down to the office and, and the fire alarm went off. 
and it was a real fire because there was smoke everywhere, and it was four below zero outside with about, I don't know, at that time we had about 30 inches of snow, and my room is as far from the office as you can get, so I hightailed it out the front door and ran around the entire building just hoping and praying that my students were mature enough to grab my sign and head outside to where they should go, and they did. And that's the great thing about journalism students in general. They're usually a little more mature. So, um, but that's my only concern in the freedom that I allow them. We also have a policy that our doors need to be locked. Ah, I can't do that. You know, I, I just I struggle with that because my students are coming and going. I would never be able to sit down or work or do anything if I had to keep getting the door. So I'm a rule breaker. So I think most journalism advisors are. But you know, your kids will, I just believe in giving them the freedom to make mature decisions. And if I'm going to let them be on their phone or go interview someone, I've caught them. A student has been gone for a while, they go to interview, and I go down there, and they're at the kitchen, which is open during second period, eating cookies. You look at them, and they get up, and they walk away. So it's just part of building that trust with them. So how many of you would your administrators let your kids just roam during class? As long as they have, we have press pads. OK, nice. And so as soon as they walk in, they put their press pads on, and then they're assigned by an administrator. Okay. Good. Hey, see, I need to do that. We just got a, um, a school ID maker from the guy that takes all our student ID pictures. And so now we can print press passes. So we'll have to do that this year. Yes? Just like juniors and seniors last year, <clears throat> I had them take permission slips home to their parents. Okay. But also gave them permission to be off campus. Absolutely. Without supervision. Great idea. Because sometimes to go off campus, if you have that permission, those permission slips filed, your students can, in 50 minutes, actually go interview a doctor, go interview someone that they need for a source. So very good. Only. Only juniors and seniors, yes. I have a student designated as a receptionist. And oh. Their job is to not find the kids in and out when they leave with their press passes. Oh. And also, nice. just worry to send call slips out to kids that need to meet for interview. And so we have one set of clipboards for kids, si staff members signing in and out. Oh, OK. And another clipboard where the kid that comes in for the interview signs in and out. Nice. So, Jot that one down, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, the maturity of the kids are probably not as mature as we do. Because we're not giving them that opportunity, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like in a case like that, well, we would probably only be able to do stuff like after school. But would you have the freedom or your students to call, to sit in class and make calls? Because a lot of times for their professional source, I always encourage them as one source in their story needs to be a professional source. Um, it just adds credibility to your story. So if you're writing about Susie, who's a vegetarian, and her friends and her mother, and they raise cattle, and the mom's really not for it, that's great, but why not get a, a dietitian's viewpoint and what a vegetarian needs to watch for? So a lot of those professional sources could be contacted during school hours. Is that allowed, or can they make phone calls? Cell phone. Right. <laughs> yep. So. OK. That would be one way that they can, they can work. They can't leave the classroom, but yeah. yeah, that might be something to think about. And email, setting up interviews, texting, setting up interviews. Yeah, stuff like that. Yes. One last question. Yes. When your students interview other students, are those students required to sign, um, what is it called, a um, press release form? Mm -hmm. No, we have an opt-out list at our school of parents who have, and or students who don't want to be contacted by recruiters, which also includes not being in the newspaper, not being in the yearbook. There's very few on that list, so you may ask your secretary in the office if you even have one. Um, it's usually very few. And sometimes I'll call the parents if we would like to interview their child and say, I don't know, I saw that your child's on the opt-out list. Was that primarily for recruiters? Oh, yeah, I don't want them calling. Well, it also means that they can't be interviewed. And I've had parents say, oh, I don't care about that. That's fine. 
Um, no, but that brings up a great point, um, and I'll say it now and I'll say it again when we talk about interviewing, is just last year I had my kids start, um, whether they record the interview or not, they need to take notes. You can't, you can't really guarantee that that recorder's getting everything, and so if you have both, when they're done with the interview, they need to ask the person they're interviewing, would you take a look at the notes that I've written and make sure that I heard correctly what you said? Um, and a lot of times they'll go, oh, no, not quite. I don't think you got the gist of it. After the interviewee is agreeable to what was written down, they sign it. So my kids actually get um, points for signed interview notes. Because I've run into, we have an um, English teacher who just ran for um, office um, as a state senator. And so one of my students interviewed her and did like a Q&A and it came out right before the election and the primary election and she came to me and said, oh, he didn't get it. He took out of context what I said and it was about the oil in our state. And he took something she said in the midst of, that was negative, but she's not negative about it. And so that's when I said, okay, we're gonna have and who, what person being interviewed would not be thrilled that you're allowing them to see what you've written down? Yeah. So. Yeah, we sort of had to go a step further and do quote verification. So oh. That, we do that after it's been written because once it's gone through the editing process, okay. it's like eight million times. Mm -hmm. Something gets deleted. Absolutely. Gets and so we, um, we don't necessarily give the entire article. Sure. Just the quotes. Just the quote. Just the quote and yep. make sure it's taken in context and the kids have to get it signed. Perfect. Yep, and if, if my kids get a phone verification, then I, stupid Dell, they, uh, if it's phone, then I want the person's phone number that they interviewed. So they need to get that, have their name and the phone number. So if we have issues, I can give them a call. But that's, that's a great idea. Um, often your kids are asked by the person they interviewed, can I read the story before it's published? And our answer is no, that's pre-publishing, you can't do that, but, you can allow them to use the quotes that they said. And so that's, that's a great idea. And getting them signed is even better. Okay, yes sir. And the best of practice here at the uh, majority. Okay. Actors who check, mm -hmm. after the interview, call you back and mm -hmm. do, uh, here's what I, uh, I'm saying in the quote. Yeah. Uh, it's Georgia. Easy. Yeah, because what we hear, I tell you, go back to marriage, we're talking intimacy here. It's always good to say back to your spouse, this is what I heard you say. My husband and I, we say this. What I'm making up about what you just said is this, because we do, we make it up, right? Because we have, we hear things that really weren't said. Did you have a question? I did, I just yes. wanted to ask how you would deal with editors or, or reporters who mm -hmm. felt the urge to um, tweak the quote or to, um, what's the word, to, I am, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. They did uh, surveys last year and they asked uh, freshmen, sophomores, and seniors what was the most surprising thing about the school. And they got a number of comments that were, we were surprised that so many gay people went here. And for some reason that freaked the reporters out and they, I didn't realize this until it was asked too late, they were squashed it. And I had this dialogue, I said, well, if that's their reaction, why is that scary for you? But mm -hmm. I think it was a little too late. So they had gone through and sort of. So they actually changed the quote. Well, they deleted certain things that they thought were offensive. They just didn't use that quote. So they changed they, yeah, really the message of did. the quote. There was, yeah. You know, after the fact, you can just do some teaching. You can sit down and say, here's what you did, because I don't think they realize what they're doing, you know? Yeah. And so there needs to be some teaching. Better would be, and we'll get to this, I don't know what session, sometime today, but about I edit last. I don't look at any drafts until layout, and I know that's kind of scary to say, um, but I do it on purpose because my leadership, my editor, assistant editor, my um, section editors need to know when there's a red flag. And if they don't bring it to my attention and I read it during layout, we talk about it, we either pull it, I, they decide. We either change it or whatever, but teaching, you just need to keep teaching that you can't change what the person said. Yeah. Yes? Um, and I'm just thinking as you're talking about getting, you know, interviews and then that has as many, you know, sort of resources mm -hmm. to get out there and, right. you know, during school hours. But is there a way to record, like, FaceTime or Skype interviews or something like that? Like, to, like, if you can set up a time, like, okay, can 
Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Some kids would even FaceTime from their math class, I'm sure. Yeah. Is there a way to record it? Like to to keep that recording? Anybody know? Any techies in here? Where's Jeffrey? I don't know if you can record it so that they could show you the interview so that you have it documented. Yeah. Yeah. You could do a screenshot yeah. with the, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. On their phone, they can record on their phone while they're talking to them on Skype or whatever, too. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I try Audacity, too. I've never, okay. I've never tried um, having it record. Mm-hmm. Um, from another source other than sure. a direct mic, but Audacity might be. Yeah, helpful. very true, very true. All right, in social media, they're going to hear things on Facebook, on Twitter. They're going to find people to talk to if they're proactive about it because they'll say there's nobody talking about anything. That's where they have to learn to be a journalism student. Um, comments on web stories. Uh, see what's, go to the local paper, read what's happened in those stories, and comments. You could find a primary source by, by finding the name of someone who's commented over and over and over again about a topic, okay? All right, how many sources does a story need to have? More than one. Three. What are some other answers here? Depends on the story. I tell my kids at least three. And the reason is it goes back to there are not just two sides to a story. There are all sides. So many of our stories have three sources because that's the minimum. Okay, I say a story cannot be published um, if it doesn't have three sources. In my Journalism 1 class, if they turn in a a final draft with two sources, um, they can't get above a failing grade on the final draft. They have to have three sources. No matter how great they did writing it, it doesn't have enough sources. Because they need to be able to tell the story as truthfully as possible. And I did not tell my husband this was being live streamed because he'd probably watch it and I need to talk about him. He's, he's a wonderful man. He's a colonel in the North Dakota National Guard. Very intelligent, but he has ADD. And it was, it was diagnosed only about eight years ago when I forced him to finally go into the doctor. He had it all his life, but just, he lives in, in, we call it Dave world, and he he really remembers things differently than the rest of us. And and how I found this out is teaching Journalism One. So we have four daughters. Our youngest daughter, Alex, is currently in my class. She's opinion editor, but all four of our girls have been on newspaper. And so when they're in Journalism 1, we do that defining moment story. So someone has to interview her. But we have quite an exciting life, and so my husband ends up being a source in all their stories. (laughs) And so I, I get the draft, and I'm reading what my husband said about an event in our life, and I laugh. It becomes a really good teaching, teachable moment, because I know the story. And so I say to the student, Um, That, it really didn't happen that way. (laughs) What? I asked him, I talked to him, well, I know. Like, the gist of it is there, but his details are wrong, and blah, 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 blah. And it's great, because there is fiction in, in, in nonfiction, in journalism stories. There is fiction, because people, they do their best to tell you how they remember it. So if you interview at least three people about the same thing, you're going to get better what the story's about than if you just interview one person. So, and he means, well, we went to a state um, journalism competition, and my husband came as the uh, chaperone, and we were sitting at breakfast, and this one kid goes, oh, well, I have to write this football story, and blah, 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 and my husband goes, well, who, you know, who's, who's it about? And he goes, oh, yeah, well, he played this, blah, 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 blah. My husband just very confident in his knowledge, and so he said all that. And then he goes, well, I'm going to go take a shower, and I'll be back later. So he left, and I said to the student, you better check 
what he said. And that's all I said. <laughs> he came back later and said, that's not the position he played. <laughs> So anyway, my husband does a great job in life. He's awesome, but it's just stories. The stories are entertaining, but you really got to check the facts. So, um, so anyway, so at least three, okay? So how can you tell if a source is valid? Okay, fact check. How many of you show your kids the movie Shattered Glass? Ah. Oh. True story about Stephen Glass, the journalist that worked for the New Republic. The New Republic is a news magazine that's touted as being the in-flight magazine for Air Force One. Um, and he was, what, 26 years old. He, he fabricated, ended up finding that he fabricated 26 of 41 stories that he wrote. Um, great story. I usually do a, a whole unit on the First Amendment and the different court cases. Um, and ethics, and then we watch Shattered Glass um, because they need to fact check. And that's what it ended up being in that movie about Stephen Glass is they did some fact checking, but when it came down to he was under suspicion and they did some more fact checking, they couldn't find companies, they couldn't find people he wrote about, they couldn't find any of that. So, yes? Ah! No way. Okay. There might have been a. And Jason Blair was writing for the Times. Yep. Yep. Wow. Oh, yeah. There's a whole list. I have my kids during that. They, they get on and find out all the journalists who have fabricated stories. And if, and if you have younger kids, I'm in middle school right now. Um, there's a wonderful website called, uh, about the Pacific. Northwest tree octopus. It doesn't exist. Obviously. Pacific tree northwest. Pacific northwest tree octopus. Pacific northwest tree octopus. Pacific northwest set tree octopus. Up to look just like a website. It has references, but then when you scroll down, it says its biggest um, its, its biggest challenge is um, Sasquatch. <laughs> and, but it looks so real. And right. It's a great teachable moment for the kids at their level. It's like, wow. And, and then sure. they have to say, wait a minute. Octopi Octo can crawl through uh, and live in trees, and eventually there's one kid in the whole class who's like, this can't be real, but See, it's on the internet, finally. it looks so great. Yes, so, yes. California's Velcro crop. All right, everyone Google California's Velcro crop. Yeah, and kids believe it. You got to really teach them to be skeptical. We heard that yesterday. Teach your students to be skeptical. They shouldn't buy it. They shouldn't fall for it. They should fact check. Definitely. Pacific, and, and I'll, I'll pull it up in a, if you just tweet it. Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus, and it's a whole thing. Is Pacific Pacific Northwest Pacific Tree Pacific Octopus. Ones, like the, uh, Cooper Islands, uh, you know, Sweet. And, yes. Well, um, my students, uh, one of the topics that they, that they picked through the years was up. Uh, the you know, wanting women to play in the NFL, they don't see why women can't mm -hmm. play. And one of one of my students a couple years ago pointed out this site, and it was like world news or anything, and it just talked about NFL had young, you know, sign on as a quarterback. When I looked at the site, I'm thinking, I mean, I looked at it and I thought, seriously, this is breaking news. Right. And and I and I couldn't find anything on that site that indicated that this was in fact, um, you know, satire or mm -hmm. satire. But I looked at the date that the story was written, and mm -hmm. when it said that last night the NFL had announced this. So I, I had to go to NFL site on that particular day in my archives, and there was nothing. See. So I went back to my students and I said, we don't want to check on anything that's going to let you verify. Absolutely. That this is not oh, a yeah, we got to teach our students to fact check. Yep. They have to check. Ask each of their sources about other sources. Ask them about each other, OK? Um, ask sources the same questions. You know, you're going you're gonna to be asking them different questions, but ask some of the same questions about the story itself, OK? Find the discrepancy. And then go back to a source with follow-up questions if you do find any discrepancies. Don't just print the discrepancy. Go back and say, hey, I was talking to so-and-so, and they said this, and it didn't really you know, agree with what you said. Do you want to clarify? Okay. 
They got to do the work. They got to follow up. All right. These are some red flags, um, and I'm not going to go through them all. But you know, we need to teach our kids to really continue to ask questions about what they're writing. Okay. Um, why are they even writing the story? Because when you start doing some hot topics, um, are they writing it because it's sensational? Because that's not journalism. Okay, what is the reason? They really have to examine that. Um, are they missing anything? And this is when your students start editing each other's work and you edit it. Is that, and we'll talk about that in the next session, but you need to read through it once for content. Does it feel like something's missing? And then read through it for style book errors and all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, is it objective? Is there any opinion in it? And we'll get into that next session as well. All right, we're not going to do this because you shared some ideas, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about interviewing. So this is what I do with my kids. I need a volunteer. Come on up. Okay. I'm going to interview Lori. One word last yeah, there you go. So first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up at Lori's house. This is what I do when I begin teaching interviewing to my Journalism One students. Come in. Hey, how you Hi. doing? What's up? Uh, I'd rather be anywhere but here, yeah, but yeah, you yeah, know, you school us. sucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, geez, just awful. You know, I, you know I'm on the newspaper. I know. Yeah, anyway, they, they asked me to talk to you. I don't know. So what? What was it? Okay, wait. What was it? Uh, I don't know. Do you ride horses? No. No, that wasn't you. That was that other girl. <laughs> What's going on? Nothing. Nothing. Wow! I knew it. Oh, hang on a sec. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah. Wow. Hang on. OK. Um, well, I got to do something. I mean, this journalism teacher, ah, oh, such a, such a Nazi. Me. I know. <laughs> so um, do you have anything? I didn't bring anything to write on. Do you have any paper or anything? Here, no? no? OK, here. I can record it. OK. All right. Um, so. What are you involved in? Are you involved in a club or anything? No. OK. Um, dang, I wish I knew what the whole dang story idea. If I got to pick, I'd know what I'm doing, but they don't let me pick. That's kind of lame. Yeah. Anyway. Um, did you go to a dance last week? Did you, was that the one where three people got arrested? Yeah, was that it, was it. Were you one of them? Yes. <gasps> That's so awesome. It was fun. <gasps> I got to be in a police car and no, everything. No, that's yeah. on my bucket list. <laughs> I've always wanted to be arrested. Lucky. I know, right? Uh, now I have a rap sheet and everything. Yeah. I have to go to court. Whoa. Yeah, I might, I might even go to juvie. Really? Yeah. Gosh, ah, some people get all the luck. I know, right? Man. I'm so cool. Hey, well, can I? We should hang out sometime. We really should. Can I get your phone number? You can be arrested with me. I could. Who's your buyer? <laughs> Who's my who? What? Who's your buyer? <laughs> I don't. Sell off the anything. record. I off the record. Anything. Off the record. Where'd you get the alcohol? Uh, oh, oh, I, I really. I can't say, it. Grandpa. Well, it was it was Joe's grandma's friend's brother. Oh, I know him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, so you know that. He's well, yeah, and he's cheap. Yeah, because really he usually takes one for himself. Okay, I think we're getting really off topic. Okay, thank you, Lori. Um, okay, this is what I ask my students. What did I do wrong as the interviewer? Yeah, that's what they say, too. But let's pick it apart. Yes? You didn't have, you didn't have a set list of questions. I had no questions. I went totally unprepared. Okay, what else? You didn't take notes. No notes. <laughs> None. Zero. Yes. Well, you were, well, we have seen some you were at that NPC, wasn't there? No. So you weren't really going to get a good story no. because you weren't connected. You exactly. Weren't connected. I was checking. 
It is. We got to teach these kids. You had something too. Oh, I was going to say they're so close. Oh, okay. Really okay. Faster. You were expecting them to be the main dog. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Tell me. Tell me what's going on in your life. Yes. Close ended versus open ended. <laughs> yeah. That's a big thing that we do. Yeah. Excellent. You, you need to. 15 right. Close -ended Absolutely. You have to ask. Well, now I tell my kids, you can ask the close-ended, the yes or no questions to put the person at ease. You know, you need to break the ice. I always say to my students, who do you think is more nervous, you or the person you're interviewing? What do you think? The person you're interviewing. Their life is on the line. Yours isn't, really. I mean, they, they're, they're nervous, so put them at ease. Yes. Sure. You know, uh, your school does in charge of me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the balance. Because some of my kids are really good with it and some right. it's difficult. But then when you're interviewing other students, that's where it's that's where they have like not cool the cool factor. Cool. They got to kind of be cool. Yeah. Okay. What else did I do wrong? You also showed early on that you didn't, uh, you weren't committed. You had, you didn't believe in what you were doing. Not at all. It was a class. Yeah. It. I had to get a grade. The teacher was a Nazi. Okay. What else? I had no idea what my topic was. I asked her for paper <laughs> and something to write with. Don't do that, okay? What did I What did I not do at the very beginning when I walked through the door? <laughs> Introduce myself. Yes. And thank them. At the end, we really didn't conclude the interview, but what should every interviewer do at the end of an interview? Thank them. Exactly. Is there anything we didn't get to that you would like to add about this? And another good question is, is there someone else I should talk to about this? That's how you get other sources. Checking the spelling. Checking the spelling. So, hi, I'm so-and-so. I work for the paper, and um, we're really interested in topic, um, blah, blah, blah. Could you spell your first and last name for me? We have a teacher at our school. His name, name is Greg Schmidt. I always use him for an example because his first name is G-R-E-G-G. -G -G. Don't assume that you know how to spell their name. And so, yeah, so you need to ask them how to do that. You didn't ask for permission to record. No, nope. I'm going to record. Here, I'll record. In between text messages, I'll record, right? Okay. Again, we're talking intimacy. So when we get to the interview, you kind of know about the person because you've, you've done some research, you know what your angle is. And so you're walking in knowing a little bit about him. I knew a little bit about my husband. He was cute. I, I went to a forestry club meeting so I could see him. Um, I knew he was a forestry major. My roommate told me a little bit about him. And so I had done my research. Then I got to the interview, okay? Um, so, and these are points by Rob Melton. This is on your flash drive as well. Um, but define the purpose of the interview. Tell them why you're there. This is you taking the lead. Um, complete your background research. Request an appointment. So this is, the first four points are before you even get to the interview. Preliminary planning of questions and strategy. You wanna come with questions. I always tell my students it's a lot like fishing. So you go with, with the bait and everything, and you sit there and you cast out, you do everything, you follow that formula, but once the fish bites, you gotta let the fish take the lead, okay? Um, and then reel them in. And it's the same with interviewing, because my students could go with 20 questions, and I say, once you hit the hot point of the interview, and it may be an angle you weren't even thinking about, don't keep going through your questions. Let them take the line out a little bit. You have to switch gears, okay? So you, you do all this, then you meet the person, some icebreaker questions. Um, then you get down to business. After you feel like they're at ease, you're at ease, laughter is a good thing, okay? Establish rapport. Then you're going to ask the tough questions. Don't, don't go there, introduce yourself, say, can you spell your first and last name, and then can you tell me about the night you were raped? <laughs> don't do that, okay? 
how long have you been here? You, have you, did you grow up in Bismarck? Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Get to know them. Remember to ask the follow-up questions. This is so hard for students. And again, maybe with adults it's easier, but when they're interviewing their peers, they want to get in and get out, right? And be cool the whole time, right? Um, conclude the interview with what question did I not ask about the topic, okay? So very good. Then you also need to learn to follow the lead. I'm not a very good dancer. My husband's a wonderful dancer. And because he's such a wonderful, he can lead so wonderfully. When we were in college and we started dating, we would go dancing and like country swing. And we actually won a dance competition at a bar, <laughs> which doesn't say a whole lot. But I, it's not because of my skills. It's because my husband was such a great, could lead. On the other hand, I'm a very, very independent person. My mom said to me when my husband asked me to marry him, she said, you better say yes, because he's the only person I know of that will let you be as independent as you are. And we are, we both travel all over. We're, we're very independent, we have a great relationship. Um, but it's hard for me sometimes to follow the lead. I wanna lead. I'm a terrible participant. I don't wanna be sitting where you're at. I like this. Um, because, and when I teach, that's what I love about teaching. I'm active. I don't sit behind the desk. And so this, this is the tough part for me, and I think it's the tough part for our students, but you need to follow the lead. Um, you need to be prepared, okay? And that's the submission to the interview. You need to come in with your stuff in a group. You need to watch and listen. Somehow we have to teach ourselves and our students that silence is okay. Let the person think. If there's silence, it's because they're formulating an answer. But we want to fill the silence. Oh, okay, so you don't know it? Okay, let's go on to another question. Well, don't do that. Yes? When, when they're open to me and they ask me closed ended questions, mm -hmm. they get that short answer. I, I teach them, you know, the magic three words to say at that point is, tell me more. Ah, and then, yeah. Uh, That's my next one. Do you see that? You have to know, no, that's good, that's good, I'm on the right track. You need to know when to shut up. And tell me more. If you feel like you need to fill in that silence, that's fantastic. Tell me more. It's great as a follow-up question. They don't even have to think about what the follow-up question is. Just say, can you tell me more? Or how did that feel? What was that like? You know, okay. Be selective in note-taking. Again, the shorthand, their version, something that they can figure out later, but they should take down, if it's a great quote, like the kid, the seventh grader in Williston saying, it was, what, what did he say, it was the best Christmas, it was a really good Christmas, that was a direct quote. You gotta look for those direct quotes, write them down word for word. Um, but the other stuff is information you're gonna put in your news paragraphs, and so, um, Learn to take shorthand, be selective in note taking. For one reason is that the eye contact, I didn't make eye contact. I was looking at my phone. I, I made eye contact once I knew she got arrested. That was really cool. Um, and you know, I have to say that, true story, our third daughter did get arrested. Good kid. Out of the three girls, she's the best kid. She happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And yeah, she knew it. And anyway, she got arrested, brought her home at two in the morning from the police station. and. Our other daughter, the older daughter, who went through more of a rebellious period prior to that, started talking to her as big sister, like, oh my gosh, and did you go in the police car? Yeah. And she goes, they even handcuffed me. What? They handcuffed you? I've always wanted to be handcuffed. And I said, go to bed. You are not being a big sister right now. I couldn't believe it. She was jealous. And that's, uh, that was funny. Um, probe for an anecdotes. Okay, you need to ask the questions that will give you an anecdote. And we'll, we'll go through that when we get into the writing because there are three different ways you can write these stories. One of them, and all of them really, the anecdotes pull at the emotions of the reader. And if you can grab a reader's emotions, you've got them hooked. They'll read your story. But you need anecdotes. So you need the questions that, what did that feel like? Can you describe when you received the award? Um, what, what gives you the motivation to get up every morning after this happened? Okay, yes sir? When you're teaching these students to interview, mm -hmm. 
do you do mock interviews in class? And if so, how long is that process of, of practicing uh, the interview? Not very often, um, I, or not very long. I teach interviewing in one class period. We review it periodically and randomly. I'll go, okay, two people up here, we're gonna do an interview, mock interview, just to refresh them. But I teach interviewing in one class period. I go through all this. You know how I start it? There's a great lesson on hsj.org. Uh, just type in interviewing, find the interviewing. It's called Shouting Out the Window. I do this every semester, so I've done it 14 times. And sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the makeup of the group. But what you do is I'll be teaching a style book rule or something that day at the beginning of class, and then I walk by the window and I go, whoa, oh my, wow, I can't believe, oh, so what do they do? They all get up and I go, no, <laughs> sit down. Just, just ask me, what do you want to know? And they go, well, what's going on? And I go, there, there's a person laying in the street. We have a coffee shop across the street from the high school. There's a person laying in the street. There's a car stopped. I don't know, I'm assuming they got hit. Whoa, well, what's going on now? Who is it? Can you tell who it is? Pretty soon someone catches on. Sometimes I've done this and they sit there like this. <laughs> then I feel like an idiot. But more often, so try it. This is where, yeah, I have failed, but 90% of the time it works for about 40, 30, 40 seconds. And then you get the student that goes, there's nothing going on out there. And I say, no, there isn't. But what did you want to know? Well, we wanted to know what was happening and who it was happening to. And when we get into writing, that's important. Okay. So when you talk about what questions do you ask, you want to find out the what, but you want to, sh you want to show it, not tell it. We'll get into that too. Um, but in order to show what happened, you have to have them tell you the story. So you have to ask questions to get them to tell the story. Okay? And then you have to shut up and let them tell you. All right. Learn how to ask questions. It is a skill. Rephrase the answer. What I'm making up about what, you're, what you just said is this. Um, take notes even if you record the interview. Consider, consider the time and the place of the interview. Location, location, location. Go to Williston. Go to McDonald's if they work there. Go to the scene of the accident if they were in a terrible accident. I'll tell you what, if they're willing to walk around that area while they interview, Boy, you're going to get the emotion of it. So don't be afraid to go there. Um, all right. So, so far what we talked about, we just have a few minutes. What do we, is this the end? Yeah, it's the end, and I have time for questions. Um, what questions do you have about interviewing? Yes? I don't, it's not a question. It's just something I want to share that sure. hopefully other people can learn from. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about fact-checking, we did a story one I should give this to you. We had a band competition at our school, um, an annual band competition. And so we had somebody on staff do the story about the upcoming band competition. Mm -hmm. And the story got published. And the president of the student council called me, and he was really upset. And he said, you put in there that the admission cost to this band competition was $3, and it's $5. Oh. And I said, Oh my god. Well, gosh. that is huge. So when they're trying to raise money. That's right? big. Yeah. So I, I went and talked to the reporter cuz you know we just cost them money. And um, I talked to the reporter and I said, "Where did you get this information from?" Cuz that was something I didn't think to check. Well, and he had talked to somebody that was in a band that was in the competition the year before. Oh. And and I said, that's not your primary source. Uh -uh. And so, you know, I point that out to tell my kids that you can, you can cost people money absolutely. by uh, doing an inappropriate, absolutely. you know, not checking your facts. Oh, absolutely. Great story. You know, um, years ago, I told some of you this last night, but um, I had the, our superintendent's daughter on staff. 
That's a little nerve-wracking. Um, on one hand, he was very supportive of our program. On the other hand, I don't know, it's just nerve-wracking. But she was a great reporter. She was determined to write a story about meth usage in our school because at that time, meth was big. Then it was ecstasy. Now it's these little tea packets. I mean, stay informed what your kids are doing. Sparkle. Um, anyway, back then it was meth. I'm like, wow, OK, let's do it. I mean, never say no. Never say no to your kids if they want to write a story. It may not get published, but let them try it. So anyway, um, I said, you need a primary source. You need someone who's going to talk. I suggested someone who's been through treatment and is willing to talk about it from the other side. She found some sources. All along the way, she's getting professional sources. She was amazing. But every time we found a primary source, they would call her the next day and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and so we just kept running into dead end after dead end. And so we gave her one more month for the story. It took her two months to write the story. Um, we finally found a primary source at the penitentiary in town. He was a graduate of our high school. He had been out about three years. Um, he was in for meth and um, started dealing it. Uh, and so I forget how she even found him, but we had to go to the penitentiary to interview him. So. I had to go because she wasn't 18. My photographer wasn't 18. We were allowed to take pictures, um, but we had to go through the background check. We had to get there. We had to check all our stuff. They had to pat us down. We had to go into a little room. He walked in with handcuffs and cuffs on his ankles in his orange jumpsuit, um, sat down, and I just sat there. That's the cool thing about being an advisor. Be there, but let them do the work. Again, it was like Williston. They were so pumped up. But they asked him questions. Great quote. Um, he, they said, what advice would you give high school kids? And he said, don't ever try meth. The first time you try it, you're hooked. Um, and it destroyed my life. Um, just a powerful interview. Anyway, I say all that to say with the sources, after two months, we published that story. And she had 17 sources in that story. Um, we send a copy of our paper every month to our governor. If you don't do that, I suggest that you do that. Find out what his or her address is. Send it directly to their home. On occasion, we would get a note from the governor. Um, the governor let the senator, our senator in Washington, D.C., know about the story. The senator contacted us and asked if we could send some copies to Washington. And so, you know, what your kids can do, that's just the thing opportunities, but 17 sources. She didn't stop at three. Okay? Yes? Did you publish the story about the uh, 12 pregnant girls? Uh, yeah, we did. Oh my gosh, that's great. I have to tell that story too. Um, I don't need this. Well, we, we, we thought, we actually ended up covering, we talked about all of them, didn't give all of their names, and we covered three of them. One who had already had her baby, one who was pregnant and staying in school, and one that was pregnant and dropped out of school. And so we wanted to talk about the different avenues, the different journeys that these young moms were taking. And the writer that was writing it, this goes back to earning the right to write a big story. They gave this story to not, one of our writers that wasn't the strongest writer, but we helped her along the way. We edited. Um, I just kept saying, you've talked to the dads, the parents, da 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 She told me the one um, baby that was already born um, she talked to the mother, but the father refused to talk to her. I said, well, you approached him or whatever. Yep, he declined. Okay, blah, blah, blah. The story came out. The cover is um, a picture of that baby, the baby who was born, a picture of his ultrasound of his face on the cover, and then the story. In the story, it makes the mom, the way the story was written, the mom is hardworking and staying in school and trying her hardest. And although she didn't say anything bad about the baby's father, she said, on occasion, he'll watch the baby. And if I need diapers, he'll buy diapers, whatever. The day the paper came out, guess who was in the office, the principal's office, but the dad. He said, I never gave permission for my son's picture to be on the front cover of this paper. I was never interviewed for this story, and I'm going to sue. I'm going to contact a lawyer, blah, 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 blah. And thankfully, the assistant principal they talked to said, OK, just calm down. He said, I have a feeling that the problem, that your problem is not with the paper. Your problem is with 
the mother of your child. And I, why don't you go talk to her? Because she was interviewed, that's the information that she gave the reporter. I will talk to the journalism advisor. Don't we always get pulled into the principal's office? Yep. And uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. I, I asked for interview notes, blah, 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 blah. And very sheepishly, this girl said, well, I didn't actually talk to the dad, but the mom said he would never talk to me. Come to find out, she didn't have custody of the baby, he did. She was seeing a psychiatrist. Um, they deemed her not capable at that time to take care of the baby. Oh, huge. The girl was in tears who wrote the story. I mean, it was after the fact. But we sat down and we walked through what went wrong. She's actually pursuing journalism now in college, but I think she learned more from that. She failed, but I, I believed in her, you know, you don't have to stop, but you can't ever do this again. And, and it was a teachable moment. And thankfully, the dad did work things. I don't know if he worked things out with the, his, the mother of the child, but he took that avenue and let us handle internally what happened. But yeah, very easily. He could have sued us. We never talked to him. Yes? Did we what? No, um, we talked about, um, when did we do that story? Is it fall or spring? I think it was fall. They talked about in the spring doing a follow-up story, but we never did. Yeah. That would have been something fun to extend that story onto the web. And as the kids were born, do where are they now? Did the one girl graduate? Did the other get back in school? Whatever. Yeah. She must have a very supportive principal. Oh, and here's the great thing. You know, I hear the great thing about my professional life is my principal was my principal for five of the last seven years. And then he applied for the assistant superintendent position and got it. Um, we have a great relationship. We have become friends, and so now I've got friends in high places. Um, I have to tell you one quick story. I don't know if the live streaming people are going or not, but uh, we wrote a story. We did a hero issue this spring, and so we did students and teachers, um, heroes, um, kind of not your you know, normal hero, but just different things. Well, our assistant superintendent um, had been a rescue diver for years in North Dakota. He never did rescue anyone, but he did recover a lot of bodies. Um, it was a great story, and he would not give us a picture. He would not submit a picture. So my writer kept trying to contact him. He kept making promises. We said, you could just come in. We'll take a picture of you, but we need a, we need a picture. He ignored us, ignored us, ignored us. So one day, I have a cell phone number. <laughs> we sandbagged together last summer. So I had his um, cell phone number. So on the board, I drew a picture of him in a, in a wetsuit. No, yeah, I tried to draw him in a wetsuit. And then I took his school picture and blew it up to 8 by 10 on our copier, and I put that next to it. And then we have a staff artist, and she drew a better picture of him in a wetsuit. And then I found a picture on the internet of Hitler, because he kind of looks like Hitler. He's got the little mustache. And so I put option one, option two, option three, option four. I took a picture with my phone and I texted it to him. He wrote back one word, seriously? <laughs> and I said, well, it's your choice. And he said, I don't care. And um, no, did he say I don't care? Yeah, I think he said, I don't care. And I said, okay, well, We'll decide which one we're going to use. And a little bit later, he texted back and he said, no, I want option three, <laughs> which was our artist who drew really a great picture of him. But he laughed. I ran into him later, and he laughed. So anyway, are we good? Any last questions? Are you ready to take a break? Just one quick question. Yes. Where are you from? Bismarck, North Dakota, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Not from there originally, but lived there long enough that I say my O's like that. Oh, sorry, yes. you might have mentioned this already, but do you recommend that your reporters keep a hard copy of their notes? Mm -hmm. so that if Actually, ever since we started, I, I started collecting uh, signed interview notes, I keep a file of them. Yep. So.